Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation. I am High Fitzgerald, Associate Provost for University Outreach and Engagement, and I have the distinct privilege of welcoming you to the MSU Global Engagement Speaker Series and introducing today's speaker. Sponsored by International Studies and Programs, University Outreach and Engagement, and the Graduate School, the Global Engagement Speaker Series invites individuals of distinction from higher education, global organizations, and philanthropies to share their thoughts, research, and practice with the MSU community. Advancing understanding and dialogue about fundamental human rights and meeting basic human needs is the core of the series. And speakers highlight the role of higher education as a collaborator working with civil societies, governments, and industry to enhance social or societal well-being. In addition to those of us participating on campus, presentations in the Global Engagement Speaker Series are being live streamed to an audience around the world over the series YouTube channel. I invite online viewers to submit questions or comments they may have for our speaker through the live chat feature that accompanies the live stream. We will share these, those submissions during the question and answer portion of the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Thelma Awari. Thelma Awari is a former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Director of the Regional Bureau for Africa of the UN Development Program. During her 12 years with the United Nations, she also served as Deputy Director did serve as the deputy director. <laughs> of the United Nations Development Fund for Women and as a resident coordinator of the UN system in Zimbabwe. An activist for women's rights and economic empowerment, Dr. Awari is the founding co-chair and president emeritus of the Sustainable Market Women's Fund, formerly Sirleaf Market Women's Fund. Her work with Market Women has expanded to Uganda through the Institute for Social Transformation, an organization she helped to found. Dr. Awari is also an active member of the Gender Is My Agenda campaign, through which she promotes an inclusive agenda for the voices of marginalized minorities, majorities and rural and market women. She also serves on a number of intergovernmental, private sector, and civil society boards, both globally and in Uganda. Dr. Awari earned her baccalaureate degree from Harvard University and a Master of Arts at the University of California, Berkeley, before completing her doctorate in education at Teachers College, Columbia University. Please join me in giving a warm welcome, Spartan welcome, to Dr. Thelma Awari. Thank you, Provost. <laughs> Oops, you can give it to them. Thank you, Provost, and thank you all for coming. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for organizing this speaker series to encourage those of us who are out in the field, so to speak, to come and share our learnings, our activities with you at the university and to see how we can find better ways of collaborating so as to enrich the work we are doing together. I am pleased that when I was asked to, to give this talk, I was given the freedom to choose my topic. And the topic I have chosen is one that is very close to my heart. Can you hear me back there? Very well, yes. It's very close to my heart. It's something that I've worked in for years. And uh, I would like to share some of it with you. And in sharing it with you, it uh, corresponds to my approach to how I work with people. I don't believe too much in speaking for people. I think it's important that people should speak for themselves. So I have chosen to <coughs> find ways of bringing the women I'm going to be talking about into this room so that they can tell you their own stories. So if you don't mind, uh, you will be seeing some videos about the women. 
and some pictures where I couldn't get videos or where they haven't made videos, I have still pictures of them. I think it's very important that you should see the people that I'm talking about. So today I'm going to spend a bit of your time, a little bit of your time, talking to you about the achievements of African women in the field, in the sectors of economic empowerment and the sector of peace and security. I have chosen these two sectors because these are the sectors that I work in most, but I think they're very pivotal to uh, progress on the continent, economic empowerment, peace and security. And those of you who know Africa can immediately tell why those two sectors are very important. The second reason I've chosen this topic and focusing on achievements is because I feel that I'm exhausted, tired of the narrative about African women that speaks of them or speaks of us as people who are disadvantaged, uh, on the margins. Yes, we might be on the margins, but we are moving very quickly to the center. I also believe that uh, this never-ending discussion on the poverty and disadvantage mentality does not lift our sights to what African women have done to overcome many of these challenges. And I would like to lift our sights to, uh, to those achievements. I think that a focus in this direction might shift some of our ideas as to how we do development so that we are not so focused on the problems, but that we are following the new ideas that are coming out of the knowledge that women are creating from the things they are doing to address the, their own realities. I also feel that looking at these achievements gives dignity and recognition to women that they so much deserve. It also helps, helps us to map out the successes and the enabling factors and the means of replication where that is possible. So that's why I have chosen to speak to you about these achievements. I am convinced that since Esther Bosser wrote her book in 1970, on the seminal role that African women play in food production in their countries, the calls for women to participate in development became hollow. Because if you are familiar with what was happening at that time, and I must say that yesterday I gave a talk at uh, one of your colleges, and uh, I asked if anyone knew something that was happening in 1995, and everyone looked blank. And then I realized <laughs> I was in company that was not born. <laughs> by 1995, I can't imagine anyone not born by 1995. <laughs> the provost and I were talking about things that happened after the Second World War, and I said, yes, that's right. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, but in those early days, post-independence, the call to African women was always, women, you must come out and participate in development. You must come out and participate in development. But until Bossero brought her book, it seemed unclear to everyone that really, the women were the ones actually doing development. They were growing the food. They were taking care of the families. They were, they were doing everything. But, uh, Somehow or another, the work of women always tends to be invisible, unpaid, of course. So there was always that call to come out and participate. Until some development are you talking about? Maybe it's something else you are talking about. But we, like Achola Okeo, Achola Pala, if you know, uh, the anthropologist, Achola Pala from Kenya, she wrote and says, no, no, no. <laughs> the development we are participating in is our development. We don't know what you are doing. You might be doing something else. So due to the limitation of time, I am not going to uh, take time to talk to you about uh, how we have moved, how, how, 
how uh, the discourse, the international discourse, has shifted and has grown, has expanded to, uh, to capture these contributions and the conditions of these contributions, to, to look for new concepts that will help us to understand what women are doing, the new concepts of gender, gender development. It is a long, uh, a long period of discussions to come up with all of these concepts and to develop the tools that were necessary to help us understand what was going on. The tools, these tools have provided data for stronger advocacy and the creation of policies and practices uh, that support the economic activities of women. So uh, where possible, I will try to talk about some of these activities that women are doing and uh, to bring them into this room for you. Now, let me start to focus on economic empowerment. Dr. Margaret Snyder, and she's written two books. You know, when you come to universities, you must mention books. <laughs> Dr. Margaret Snyder has written two books on African women in development. Any one of them, um, I think it's the one on uh, women in the boardroom, from fields to boardroom or something like that. Maybe someone wants to look it up and tell me the correct name. Uh, she, she tells about what happened in 1975. If you're not born in 1975, don't worry, I will tell you what happened. <laughs> she tells what happened in 1975 at the first International Conference for Women in Mexico. A pre-meeting, and normally there is a pre-meeting for the NGOs. At one of these pre-meetings, a little woman from Ghana stood up and said, she was the delegate, her name was Mrs. Esther Oklu. She stood up and remarked on the failure of banks to extend credit lines to women. This message had been given to her by a group of Ghanaian women who had met with their first lady in preparation for the conference. And they were told, this is the message you are carrying to the conference. So she and the first female Chief Justice of Ghana, Annie Jaggi, Mrs. Annie Justice Annie Jaggi, were given the responsibility to go to Mexico and carry this message and see what could be done about it. So that statement of Esther O'Clue gave inspiration to the creation of what became Women's World Banking. I don't know if anybody in here ever heard of Women's World Banking. Yes? You know about it? Yes, I see. Well, you can put up your hand and say you know about it. <laughs> Maybe you worked in it. Are you from Kenya or Uganda? I'm from Ghana. You're from Ghana, that's right. Ghana is one of the countries where Women's World Banking uh, was established. These, uh, they, she, they had 10 affiliates in Africa, all over the continent, east, west, north. And uh, they set up loan uh, guarantee schemes in banks so that the women would have some access to credit. Esther O'Clue herself was an entrepreneur. And let me see if I can now work this thing. I'm never a good student, but... Uh, no. Use this. Yeah, that's Esther O'Clue. You can guess which one she is. <laughs> <laughs> the other one is Diana Ross. Yeah. Yes, you know that one. I, don't, I can't remember quite who that one is. But uh, this was at uh, the prize giving. She, had, she got the prize, the Hunger Prize, one year. And you can see what a small lady she was. But she was a very uh, formidable woman. She was an entrepreneur and industrialist in the food sector, packaging Ghanaian foods, including juices and soups. Her strong national and international voice put her in many positions of national and international leadership. She was founder of the first national, she was founder and first national president of the Federation of Ghanaian Industries in 1950. In 1964, she was the first executive chair of the Ghanaian National Food and Nutrition Board. Dr. Oklu was a philanthropist 
because she gave a lot of her time moving around Africa at the request of the Economic Commission for Africa, teaching women how to process food and how to run businesses. I was absolutely pleased. One day in Ghana, I had gotten a little bit lost, so I was sitting in a car waiting for my daughter to come and pick me up. And when I looked up to be able to tell her which street I was on, it was the Esther Oklu Street. So it's very nice to know that the country recognizes the women and the contributions they have made. So the finance and banking sector at present in many countries in Africa is structured largely to cater for the small group of commercial operations and individuals who can meet their criteria. Requirements for opening a bank account demand physical presence at the bank. You have to go there. So if you're a village woman living very far away, that's going to be a little bit of a challenge. It also will ask you for a utility bill. And if you are somewhere in a village far away, you don't, you don't do utilities. So you don't have a utility bill. Maybe you might instead substitute your, your local registration with the local authorities. A photo and, of course, literacy. And that's the big challenge. Literacy in the official language of the country, which most women are unable to make. They are therefore excluded from the banking sector and from access to credit. All of the documents, all of these things in the official language, so this, this can be a problem. So a vast majority of this population are usually described as unbanked. They are unbanked. And I would prefer to refer to them as not yet banked because I know they will be banked at some time. So banks also have this perceived uh, question of the risk of dealing with this population. And so they have a hesitation to, to, to get out and, uh, and include them in banking. Well, Women's World Banking established these loan guarantee microfinance institutions. And uh, many of the best minds the women who knew about banking and finance, who were working in banks, gave their time to, to work on these institutions and uh, to find the financing because Women's World Banking paid for training, et cetera, and there was a loan guarantee scheme. But they had to develop a capital base. And these women really worked very hard to develop this uh, capital base. I must say that uh, we need to applaud them for that. Esther Clue called for the banks 50 years, or to be precise, 42 years ago. That's a long time in coming. How many banks do you think we would have established by now over the, over the span of that time? Well. I'd like to acquaint you with some of the attempts that have been made to give women access to credit. And uh, in so doing, to introduce you to some people who are trying to do things. One of the persons I would like to introduce you to is Zanelli Mbeki. Those of you who are familiar with African studies, the name Mbeki rings a bell. <laughs> She is uh, the wife of uh, Becky, the former president of South Africa. But those of us who know Senele know that she's always done her own thing. Tabo can do his own thing, but Senele does her own thing. And uh, she was very much influenced by Mohammed Yunus and the work he was doing in Bangladesh, defying the economic and banking systems that excluded poor by setting, us, setting up his own Grameen Bank. So she decided she would give birth to an institution that would give poor women access to finances. So using some of her own funds and funds from friends, she set up this institution. And I would like you to 
have a chance to hear her talk about it. Okay, that was Sandele and Becky, and I hope you, you got her approach. What she's done when they talk about IH, it's a holding company that makes investments in, uh, on the stock market or in other companies, and then the profits they make is what they put into the work of giving financing and training and all of that to women. This means that they don't have to be so dependent on donor funding or not do their work when donor funding is not there. Now, let's go to Tanzania, and I'd like to introduce Honorable Tifota Likokola, very vibrant woman, who decided that she would also try to tackle the issue of giving women access to financing. Tifota was also inspired by Sewa in India and the Grameen Bank. And she decided to set up a village community bank just for women. It's a former MP. Tanzania started a women's bank because they were very excited about the idea of a women's bank. But it was set up with government funding, and it, even though it still exists, it's, it's just ailing. It's, it's not doing very well. So we don't talk about it too much. We'll see how it, how it evolves. But the 
village banks. Village banks, the village community banks are a big thing in Tanzania. They have village banks for religious groups or university professors can have their own village bank, you know, whatever. If you think you are villagers, you can have your own village bank. But uh, she set up this, it's called Vicoba. They, they refer to it as Vicoba. She set up this Vicoba for women to promote finance accessibility to communities, to promote economic income activities, and to improve living standards of people. <coughs> Vicoba now has 22,500 groups all over Tanzania. And they have 626, 126 members. All of these groups are independent entities. When I said to them, how, what is your capital base? How much money would you say you have? I can't tell you. Because those groups, the money of those groups belongs to them. And they're not, you know, they're not bringing it to a central place. They're just circulating it amongst themselves. Lending to themselves, doing their business, putting profits back into it, and lending to themselves. What Vicoba does is to give them training and to give them the books for doing their accounts and membership cards and things like that. So Vicoba does not, and, and they, pay, they buy those things from Vicoba. So that's how Vicoba itself makes its money from selling those books. And uh, so they, they also are not dependent so much on outside funding. Now, of course, this is making the government rather nervous. Because how do economists measure GDP or GNP when there's all this money floating around that you, you can't control? It's not, going through the, it's not going through the system. And that's why I feel that someday, someday, we are going to have a change in the way we count productivity because of these new things that are happening. The practice of member savings and lending groups is widespread all over Africa. I want to show you a picture of Devota. There's Devota, happy as ever doing her thing, giving certificates to her, the groups, etc. She's a very jolly person. When she comes into a room, it just brightens up the whole room because she has this wonderful big smile and laugh, you know. And there she is doing her work. I wanted you to at least see her. I don't have a, I don't have a video with her, but uh, we'll see. So this practice of savings and loans is so widespread if you, those of you who have been working in Africa for a long time know the practice of tontines and susu groups that we have in the markets, etc., those things have developed so much now, there are all kinds of renditions of them. In Kenya, for instance, you have what you call the chamas and the sakos. Sometimes I think the chamas are on the, on the, on the horizon of these groups, of these kinds of arrangements. They are not only savings groups, they are investment groups. The chamas take their money and they invest it in transportation business or hotels or other kinds of, uh, well, commercial operations that bring money back to, to the members. I know one chama in Kenya of young women, they're young professional women like you, and they, they have about a million dollars now in their assets. They started off and they taxed each one of them $10,000 each. If you want to join, you pay $10,000 each. And there were many women who were able to do that. They have 60 members and almost all of them have paid up their $10,000. So now they're buying a land in places and subdividing and selling. So now they are looking for impact investors because they're buying a piece of land in Malindi on the coast and they want to, they want to set up a conference center with uh, facilities and you know all this kind of stuff. It's called Twigger House. But imagine a group of 60 women with a million dollars. 
that they want to invest. And they're looking for impact investors who can come and join them. So the boldness of these groups cannot go unnoticed. And I'm sure during the question and answer time, many of you will have stories for me about other groups you know that are equally bold and doing wonderful things. The last uh, story on economic empowerment that I'd like to share with you is a story of the Inat Bank. Because here we get to the stage where there's a group of women in Ethiopia who have, who decided to establish a bank financed by women and run by them. They have men who they hire, but uh, it's financed by them and run by them. 11 of them put their money together to establish the Inat Bank. And I think it's very important that uh, the Inat Bank should tell you their own story. This bank is owned by uh, majority owned by women, 64% of the equity is owned by women. And it is the first bank uh, that has declared profit to its shareholders during the first year of operation. Uh, we have uh, board mem members composed of 11 people, seven of us are women, and the rest are men. And this is, this is unique, and uh, this again is the lesson in terms of women's leadership and women's capabilities. The example of the Nat Bank is, I think, uh, is, is very compelling. The Nat Bank um, was established by women, for women. The vision of our bank is to empower women in economic capability. Right now, we currently have over 17,000 customers. Out of those, 11,000 are women, which uh, represent 63%. We serve men and women equally. We have products that for both of them. However, most of our products are gender sensitive to empower the women and to hear their voice and to come closer and come up with programs that can feed their needs and tailor to their needs. We don't believe that the women have to have money to come to us. They can come with penny and we teach them how to build, how to feed. And this is my example, like us. She came to the bank, very young, going to the construction business, and no one accepted her because she's a woman. And she came to my bank, she has no collateral. We looked at her um, need. We sent her to a partner in Ethiopian Development Co Corporation for capacity building. And of course, we do financial education to teach these women that, that they have to save. She said 5%, and we went and gave her all what she needs. And that's what gives me no doubt collateral. After that, I started my business. The reason I joined that uh, construction industry is the big market, especially at this time in my country. And most of the time, this market is dominated by men. At first, there are a lot of difficulties. Nobody trusts me. The people think that I'm like sales person, but now I can address that challenge. So that's in that bank for you in Ethiopia. And you know, if you know Ethiopia, you know it's not easy to do anything there. The administrative processes are very, very tight. And I, I, uh, I really uh, have much respect for Miaza, the lady who uh, started. Miaza was head of the uh, Ethiopian Women Lawyers Association. And she took certain stands against the government and was put in jail. So she's a prison graduate, <laughs> and uh, she, I remember the time when Mirza had no job, busy looking for something to do. She has a family. So to, to go through that and come to this really shows a lot of courage and, uh, and determination. She's very focused on the issue of uh, women's empowerment. So that's Miazza for you. So that, uh, that is my take on economic empowerment and what women 
are doing. These are just a few examples. There are not many, just a few examples. There are so many other examples. If I were to tell you what I have seen of Ethiopian women and what they are doing in, as, in terms of being industrialists, you'd be shocked. I went to one factory that this woman has. It's one square, you know, one square mile. And it's all a textile factory. She's producing sheets and towels and t-shirts and those kinds of things, these Ethiopian gabis and whatnot to sell abroad. But they are quietly doing these things. And unless you get out of this university and go and do some research so that we know what is going on, this will be a secret all the time. We need to know what's going on. We need you to send your students out there to do some research and find out what is really happening with these women? How are they doing what they're doing? What, what moves them? What motivates them? What successes? What challenge? What, what new methods are they applying? Because this is where I think the knowledge of women really comes through. So let me quickly now move to the, to the whole issue of women, peace and security, because that's the other area that I'd like us to, 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 to dwell on a little bit. The, you know, if you look at Africa, Every time you hear about Africa, you're hearing about the problems there. There's this uh, war here and a war there and a war in the other place and everywhere there's war and what's happening with women in the war. What you don't hear is how women are contributing to peace. That's the story you don't hear and that's the story I want you to hear. I don't know how many of you have seen the film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Can you please put up your hand if you have seen that film? I beg you all, please go to the internet, buy that film, it's only $30, and see it. It is really a very profound film. Because it shows, am I, am I correct in describing it? Yes, it shows what, what women did during that terrible war in Liberia to bring peace. And these, these women working together, women at, at, at my level, women, ordinary women, but all of them working together to bring peace. I remember going to Liberia and uh, driving up country, you know, right after the, the war had finished. And I, I kept seeing these women uh, in the villages standing around in white clothes. And so I asked the driver, what, what's going on? How come every time we pass, we see these women? He said, oh, on a certain day of the week, they all come out because they are praying for peace. They were praying for peace. But they didn't only just stop at praying. They went to see, they called their colleagues from Sierra Leone and Guinea. They went to see Charles Taylor. They went to the peace talks. And at one point, when the rebels at the peace talks were not moving and not signing the paper because they were enjoying themselves. They had come from the bush and they were now living in hotels, you know, this conference, everything paid for. So they were delaying the signing of the, of the peace document. And so the women said, you have to sign that paper. If you don't sign that paper today, nobody is leaving this room. So they just cordoned off the room themselves. And uh, one soldier came out and tried to, I think he tried to kick. Oh, that was just the worst he could do. They said, we are taking off our clothes here today if you don't uh, go back in there and sign that paper. We will take off our clothes. So those who were negotiating the peace process, the Nigerians and the UN people came out and said, <coughs> what's going on? And uh, they said, this is what is happening. That paper must be signed today, or else we'll be naked here. And finally, the paper was signed. They caused the paper to be signed. And they followed up with the peace. But here is what I want to tell you about. And I want to tell you about the peace huts. When I went to do some studies in Liberia after that on women's leadership, Everywhere I went to the villages, I would say, What's, uh, so what are you people doing now? They said, oh, we want to build a peace hut. And I was wondering, what is this peace hut business that they're talking about? 
it ended up that these women, and they told me their stories when I was there during the war, they would go out and talk to the rebels because they said, those are our children, so we can talk to them and tell them to stop fighting. And then they, uh, they started getting involved in all kinds of other peace building in the community. So they set up these peace huts as a space where people could come to bring the issues of conflict. <coughs> and they would, so they would put on their white t-shirt and put on their white hair tie and, you know, and go to where trouble was to deal with the, with the peace things. So these peace huts have been in Liberia. And uh, let me see if I can find, no, 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 no. Oh, hmm. I'm sorry, I changed things around a little bit, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the peace huts have been in Liberia, and uh, later on I will show you the picture of one of the ladies who's very, very prominent when it comes to the peace huts. But the peace huts is now being rec are now being recognized as reducing the workload of the police and the justice system by handling disputes and interpersonal conflicts. The peace huts are linking the traditional re redress mechanisms and the formal justice system. The Peace Hut women have established connections between political leaders and open venues for women's participation. And the Peace Huts have been seen to be more, more sustainable, more resilient, even during the Ebola. See, so that this mechanism already existed. So when we had this terrible outbreak of Ebola, they were there and, and could help. I'll show you her picture later. So, the Liberian war was a difficult one, and I don't want to focus too much on Liberia because you would think I'm doing this because I come from there originally. But the stories from Liberia are just too great. From that little country that had really gone through 14 years of devastating war, the stories that came out of what women achieve are just absolutely great. But here's a story of women from Uganda who had worked on conflict in Uganda and had discovered certain tools and methodologies, deciding to come to Liberia and help the women in Liberia. That's what I call solidarity amongst the African women. And they did it through this organization called ISIS, ISIS Wiki. ISIS was set up as an organization just to document what was happening with women. But ISIS got involved in the peace process in Uganda and learned many things about what it means for women during war and what it means for women during peace or during the recovery process. So ISIS decided to go to Liberia and have an intervention. First, they did an assessment, just asking women one simple question. What happened to you here during the war? Just that question. And the stories that came out were just, they were, they were just mind boggling. So they decided we cannot hear these stories and not do anything. So this research turned out to be an action research project. And they had to go and get money. They had to go and get gynecologists. They had to go and get psychologists and counselors to come to Liberia, a Ugandan team, to come to Liberia and work with Liberian gynecologists and uh, counselors to, to, uh, to give attention <coughs> to the women who were suffering during the peace process. Because you see, when the UN, when, when in the post-conflict situation, when the UN decides that it's going to have reconstruction and rehabilitation, they don't, they're, they're reconstructing buildings and roads and they're reconstructing ex-combatants. What about the women whose bodies were the site of war? Reconstruction work has to be done on those bodies. And that is what these medical teams were doing. In makeshift conditions, they would go and set up a makeshift theater somewhere. And that would have, you know, you had to get the UN uh, involved because they would have the generators and they had soldiers who could bring things in. The government had to be involved. Just so many institutions had to come together 
to set up these makeshift operating theaters. I want to show you some pictures of the kind of conditions that they had to go through to get to some of these places. Can you imagine? You see the roads? You really have to love somebody to put a truck on that road to say you're going there. <laughs> you see that bridge? How do you get across a bridge like that? That's the work that ISIS was doing. Those are the kind of uh, theaters. It was set up, have a theater like that. And uh, those are some of the women who had come for, you know, for, for vetting before the operations. I, I, I wanted to show you pictures of the kinds of things that they had to operate on, but I thought you would be too traumatized by that, so I, I thought I would limit myself to these kinds of things. But look, this is how you would have to transport a woman from villages far off, because there are no vehicles in those post-conflict situations, to bring a woman to, uh, to, to, to the clinic to get services. So as a feminist organization, ISIS has developed new knowledge on a need for the reconstruction of women's bodies. The international community didn't know about this before. It was not on their radar. But now WHO has this information. The UN has this information. New knowledge on the need to support women in the reconstruction of their livelihoods, because that's what women said. Now I have nothing. My house is broken down. I, I have no, I used to be at this and I can't do it anymore. So the reconstruction programs have to include the reconstruction of the livelihoods. Training materials for health workers. So when you're doing research, please, some of these issues need to be part of your research. Your students need to pay attention to that. So let me hurry along and finish. Uh, I just have one more thing to show you. And this is about a very formidable woman that I have a lot of uh, time for because of the work she does. She started an organization called FAS, Femme African Solidarity. And FAS is the organization that has for many years run what we call the GMAC, the Gender is My Agenda campaign in, in the AU. But FAS has been working on the issue of women, peace, and security for many years. And uh, it started with election observation. It organized the women in the Mano River Union. And those women working on peace in the Mano River Union, with the support from FAS, got a prize at the General Assembly for their work. That was the first time they have ever recognized a group of women for their work. FAS is the one that has worked very much on the issue of what is the voice of women in peace processes. You see, we have Resolution 1325 now in the UN, UN Security Council Resolution 1325, that talks about women's participation, etc., in peace processes, that protection is important. FAS had been working for years on saying to the UN that women must come to the negotiating table. And the UN was saying, well, yes, that's true. But you know, the negotiations are always between warring factions. So when the women would come there, those warring factions would be insulting them. What are you doing here? Who invited you here? You're supposed to be in the kitchen. You'd, this kind of berating, they would have to suffer. But with the support from FAS, they would stick to it and be there. At, uh, to, to, to try to participate. And it meant talking to some of, the, uh, some of the, the mediators to give an opening for women to participate in these processes. So FAS has, uh, it, it has helped many countries to, to perform, to, to prepare their national action plans on peace and security. 
uh, in the Great Lakes, the Horn of Africa. Just, I mean, FAS has done a lot, and that's so much under the uh, supervision of Binta Diop. So I'm going to show you. Uh, what am I doing? Oh, no. Yeah. This is a picture of Ma Annie from the, from the Peace Huts, the lady who does one of the Peace Huts activists. So now I'm going to show you my last video, and that will be the end of uh, my speech.
the election to say, let's get the results from the ballot and not from the bullets. That's why Senegal now have, you know, almost 50 percent of women in parliament to make a difference. And to get to the people who need the help the most, you often end up in some of the most dangerous parts of Africa. I was in Goma <coughs> when M23, um, the rebel movement, entered into Goma. And I think it was, most of my family was scared, my children. And they said, so, where is she? I was there with, uh, with my staff. Uh, my colleagues uh, who live in this area, we just wake up and see M23. So it was really risky. But I think uh, when you have this work in your heart, um, sometimes you measure the risk. You have to because you have people around you. But we are so passionate by the work that we just go. And we think of the people we are meeting, the women that can go nowhere the women that are exposed, the women that we meet and tell you their stories that have been raped three times, the women uh, that are in those camps, nothing to eat. So what have they done? Uh, what do you have better than them? <coughs> Maybe your education or whatever. But they are Africans. They are like you. They are human beings. The youth's tireless efforts towards peace was recognized globally in 2011, when Time magazine included her on its annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. I think this is one of the great times um, in my life. Um, you know, wake up one day, went to my office in Geneva, somebody called me, and you are part of Time 100. I said, no, no, it must be a job. So I realized that, you know, I was doing good work if that amazing uh, uh, magazine in the world recognized your work. So it was great. Good moment in my life. And her work is far from done because Duke says she always feels compelled to speak out against what she thinks is wrong. Something she learned from the woman who influenced her the most. And uh, my mother was my own mother. I think she was born as a leader. Despite all the hurdles around her, she said, no, I'm going to be transformative in my society. So I follow her step, and I always said I, I was shadowing her. OK, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> We have time for questions. <coughs> Go ahead. <coughs> Thank you so much for coming and presenting today. Uh, I guess, um, so I'm a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Sierra Leone, so I was uh, familiar a little bit with what you were talking about in Liberia, and thank you for that. Um, and brought good memories uh, of kind of um, learning about those things and um, just and also interacting with those people. So my question uh, more deals with uh, with women in Sudan and South Sudan. Um, what do you think, um, can you talk a little bit more about the role of women in Sudan and South Sudan concerning peace and security? Mm -hmm. Take a few questions and then answer them. I just okay. Is there another question? No, no, no. I'm, I was just thinking we could take a few questions and then answer, answer them at the same time. We can talk about the Sudanese women, South Sudanese women. Yes? Uh, yeah, wait for the mic so it goes into the. <coughs> Hi, I'm Yana Berhane. I'm a student here. And I just had a question about for young women um, of my age who are in college who want to be involved in helping other women across the world and eventually, hopefully, getting into the UN. 
what do you think are some good ways of um, creating an impact or getting involved other than research and just getting in the field of some sort and finding our way into the UN in a position like yours? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes? Hi, my name is Violet. I'm originally from Uganda. I, I just... <coughs> <laughs> so I want, to, I want to hear your thoughts on... They bring you the mic. Hi, my name is Violet. I'm from Uganda. I want to hear your thoughts about the way that the government is treating women right now because of all the political upheaval that is coming as a result of lifting the presidential age limit. Because I've seen many disturbing images in the media and the role that women are trying to play in all of this, but I can't help but feel that the government is uh, treating them in a way that is beneath what women should be treated like. So I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. OK, very good. Let me take those three, and then we see what next. The women of uh, South Sudan, we have worked in GMAC. And in FAS, we have worked extensively with women of South Sudan over a protracted period of time, also in ISIS, uh, bringing those women to the AU, the training of the women, getting them to talk to, to the leaders, the, the heads of state, to state the issue. It is a very difficult time for the women of, uh, of South Sudan. Very, very difficult. They, they, what is happening to those women is just unspeakable in many ways. But they're strong and uh, they have a voice. That's very important. But the, the situation is, is, is very, very difficult for them. The space for them is very difficult. And what we are trying to do is to make more space so that their voices can be heard by positioning them, putting them in situations where they can speak, speak up more. We, we just had a meeting of African women leaders at uh, the UN under the auspices of the AU and, uh, and the UN, the UN uh, Fund for Women. And the Sudanese were there asking for a solidarity mission, because that's another mechanism we use as the African women's movement. We always carry solidarity missions to our sisters who are in crisis. I think that solidarity mission has already taken place to go there and, and pick up the women's stories and publicize it. Because if their voices are not strong enough, those voices have to be strengthened by our voices. So we come out and tell the story of what's happening with them. Uh, young women, thank you for asking that question because some of us have reached a stage now where we need to get off the stage and you need to be here talking. We are very keen on getting the young women engaged. And there are seats up here, really. There are lots of seats up here. You don't have to squeeze yourself at the back. Yeah, please come. There are seats right up here. Yeah. I think one of the things you can do is to try to connect yourself to one of the organizations that I'm talking about, it, depending on what is the specialization you want, to, you want <laughs> to be in, whether it's peace and security, whether it's economic empowerment, whether it's environment, connect yourself to one of the organizations. Start off by volunteering as an intern and come and <coughs> connect yourself to the, to the organization that I have in Uganda. It's called the Institute for Social Transformation. We work with marginalized majorities. We work with market women on economic empowerment uh, and uh, with rural women on economic empowerment. So connect yourself to one of these organizations and come and spend some time. Because as you work with that organization, you might find yourself attending meetings, like the ones I'm talking about, the GMAC. Connect yourself to the YWCA. The YWCA always brings about 50 young women to the GMAC every time we have it, and we have it twice a year. They are YWCA members, they come. And nowadays there are so many in the room that uh, you can ha no one else can hardly talk because they insist that they must talk. <laughs> and that is very good, we're very happy with that. So connect yourself to these organizations as a starting point. And then uh, as you become recognized 
for your work and your capacities, others will start to look for you. I, I, uh, in terms of career advice, well, maybe I, I'm old school, but I really believe that you should do something that's really something very credible so that people can look for you. So put yourself into what you're doing. Come up with new ideas. Put your critical thinking hat on, the training you're getting here, and come up with, with new ideas. Write. People look on the internet for who's writing about something. And uh, get yourself known. <coughs> Uganda. <laughs> Ah, yes. Life is really tough in Uganda now because the space for free expression is very, very constrained. But women are very determined not to, uh, not to be constrained. And at all levels, we saw what happened uh, when there was a land issue up north and the government came to to ask the population to be a little more considerate to investors who are coming. And the women said, no, this is the land we have to grow our food. We, you cannot give it to investors. And so they just stripped naked. And you know, for that, that is the last desperate move that an, that, that an African woman can make. And it's supposed to be a curse. And actually, I think one of the MPs who came died soon after. And so you know, that really, uh, carried a lot of, uh, but uh, the women are organized and uh, they're not sitting down. I think the government has been, uh, our major disappointment, you know, you have, when you, when you work so hard to ensure that women have the space in decision making and then they get there and start doing the opposite, that is painful. But you have to realize that uh, it's the reality we're in. Patriarchy is a very strong organization. And people have their own personal uh, needs. And sometimes they put those personal needs before the needs of the group. So uh, we've been very disappointed with many of the women parliamentarians who have not uh, spoken against the, the oppression of people and oppression of their fellow parliamentarians, even if they are women. But uh, the, the, the Uganda, uh, the UOPA, women parliamentarians, are trying to look into some of these things. But it's, it's a tough time in Uganda right now, very tough time, yeah. And as I'm mainstreaming, I'm sure that I might get to the airport and be called aside. <laughs> yes, to answer some questions, that's, that's for sure. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right way in the back, first and then. <clears throat> Hello, um, I'm Aisha from Nigeria. So um, for the northern part of Nigeria, we've had um, terrible devastations of Boko Haram. Yeah. And the deplorable state of the women there, there hasn't uh, really been any rehabilitation or um, institutions like ISIS that you said from Uganda to help women in Liberia. We haven't had any of that. And for young women like us who are thinking about opening NGOs to address this kinds of problems, um, how do we go about it and what are the resources available to us? Okay. Pass the mic up and then she'll answer again a series. Thank you so much, Thelma, for your great inspiration. Um, of course, you inspire us as someone from Liberia who's working in Uganda in this pan African solidarity, and you gave an example of Ugandan women going back to Liberia. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could just say a bit more about the potential of Pan-African solidarity for women mm -hmm. as a strategy. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marquise Evans uh, of Marquise Evans Ministries. Uh, as my uncle would once say, it's good to be here. 
my question is, what role does the church play in economic empowerment for women and the role of securing uh, peace? Uh, that's, those are my two questions. What role does the church play? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let me talk about the, the situation in Nigeria and uh, the possibility of young women organizing. I think that uh, you should try to go ahead and, and start the initial process of organizing. There are others who are organizing. They are Nigerian organizations, and we meet them. When we, when, when we go to GMAC that are working, I just can't remember the names offhand, but they're working on this issue. So you might associate yourself with them, but if you want to, to set up something new to work on a different aspect of this problem, you can invite FAS to come. In fact, Binta Diop just came back from a solidarity mission to Nigeria with the head of you and women. So you, you, you can invite either ISIS or FAS to come and help you. And they will help you to look for the money. You can go together to look for the money. This whole situation of violence against women is a very topical, topical issue right now. It shouldn't be that difficult to get money for that. Maybe you and women might even help you to get money for that. Maybe even in Nigeria you can find money for that. So uh, call on them, look for ISIS on the internet, you will find them, look for FAS on the internet. Binta is now the UN, I mean the AU um, what, special envoy on peace and security. So she, she, she can be called anywhere, anytime by women to look into any situation. So if you call her, you know, the AU has money to pay for her to come come to you or she can connect you with other people in, in Nigeria. So you shouldn't feel isolated. There, there, there's a lot going on around this and you, you can uh, connect to it. And these organizations would be only too happy to come and support you. Yeah. There's also a woman in Nigeria uh, who is the wife of one of your ministers. I think he's the minister of mines. Uh, BC, uh, Chrissy's last name. Oh, sorry, I can't remember. If she's listening to me now. She'd be very upset <laughs> if I don't remember her last name. But uh, she used to be the former head of CEO for the African Women's Development Fund. And uh, she has a lot of knowledge about these things. And she would be very helpful to you. So you have a lot of resources at your disposal to do what you would like to do. The other question had to do with uh, the potential for African women... Uh, let me put on my glasses so I can see this thing <laughs> pretty well. You, your words are the, poten the potential of African women's solidarity. I, I really think that that potential is no longer a potential. It's an actuality. Because when you see what is happening, as I told you, I don't know if I told you, maybe I told the group this morning, that we always, we, we have a mechanism called the solidarity missions. We have solidarity missions that we send anywhere where African women are in trouble. The African Women's Movement will send a solidarity mission there to raise the voices of women to look into what's going on. I, I headed the first solidarity mission that went to, to Rwanda after the genocide. Uh, I was on a solidarity mission to Zimbabwe not so long ago. Solidarity missions were just carried out to, to Nigeria, to uh, South Sudan, and Central African Republic. So these solidarity missions go on all the time. Uh, and UN, UN Women is supporting, supporting them together with the African Union. Yeah, so, so that potential is, is a reality. And we are, the work of Net in West Africa the women and WIPNET, the women of Guinea, Ghana, oh, no, no, sorry, <laughs> Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Now, of course, Ivory Coast has joined uh, the Mano River. But that group works together so closely on issues of peace and security in that area. What we need to do is to build up more 
what's happening in Central Africa. Central Africa is our, is our big uh, challenge. It's very difficult to get something going there, yet it still is the seat of a lot of, a lot of problems. We have to work, we have to, and it has great potential, but uh, we haven't managed to, to do much with it. Now for the big question, what is the role of the church? It's a very big question. Because the church indeed has a major role the church has access to the population. The church has voice. And, uh, well, you can see that the, the church, they have, most churches have women's, women's uh, groups or women's sections. Yeah, but I don't want to talk about the ministries which go out and do something, but how they organize themselves internally to raise money, to do economic things. Most churches have them. They just need to, I think, um, they need to connect more. I would like to see the church women connect more with civil society. I mean, they are civil society in a way, but uh, there's this feeling of um, we're the church, so you know, we don't want to mix with those people who are anti-government or who, you know, the rights group. So we, we need to work on that. We need to work on the relationship between church women and, and uh, civic society. But if you look at the various councils of churches in, in different countries, they, are, they speak out. They speak out on these issues. Yeah. So they, they're trying. They could do more. Yeah. We have time for one more question, that's it. <laughs> is um, based on empowering women politically. We've not really talked about that, but having women take on um, leadership on the national level. Um, Kenya recently enacted its two-thirds two gender rule, which gives a third of the seats um, in, our, in our houses to women. But you still find that whenever it comes to election time, we don't, have, we don't meet that two-thirds gender rule. And at the beginning, we thought that there were no opportunities for women to take on leadership, but now with that um, new law, it's still clear that women are not really empowered to um, take on uh, this challenge. And you find that the few women who do get to that um, national scale are, um, I would say, abused or not respected, where you find that they could even be slapped in public if they say <coughs> wrong things or, you know, they're being degraded b based on how they're dressed. And for example, in Rwanda, there's that lady who was, um, her name was Diane. Uh, she was imprisoned for going Thank against you. Kagame. So what does, what do you think about bringing up women and empowering them on this level and um, advocating for women like Diane who um, are basically thrown in jail for speaking out their minds? Yes. Uh, <coughs> Political empowerment was not uh, one of the, the sectors I chose to speak about because we just wouldn't have time to do all of the sectors. But there's just so much going on vis-a-vis -vis political empowerment and giving women the space and the voice. In the AU, for instance, we pushed for the parity, the, the principle of parity in the AU, which must translate at a national mm -hmm. level to ensure that they are there's parity in terms of decision making. So we have that, that's on the cards. It's not on the cards, it's, <laughs> it's done. And I think in the AU, they really try to implement that. Of the 10 uh, commissioners, five must be women, five must be men. And there's no, it's just not accepted for anyone to tell us that, oh, we can't find a woman to do this. No, that is not on. In Africa now, you can find a woman with, you know, the best qualifications to the best experience to do anything you want. So there's no business of telling us that you can't find a woman to do this or that. We have also, a, in the continent, found uh, ways of making new regulations that will open the door for more women to come, affirmative action uh, in, in many countries, for more women to come and uh, participate in decision making. It's not easy 
because you're talking about big change. You're talking about change in mindsets. You're talking about people feeling that their power is going to be taken away or their power is threatened. So you have to, you have to be ready for these kinds of situations. You sometimes, <laughs> you have to even try to convince the men that no, 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 it's not about taking away your power. It's just to give me a little chance to be here to say something small, you know. But it's also about training women because many women have that fear. You see, when they see what is happening to, to their colleagues who are trying to take power, and, and the difficulties they're going through, the challenges they get, as you say, you can be beaten, you can be slapped, you can be, um, it's not easy, it's not rosy out there. The change, the change our society is not rosy. It takes a lot of courage. We also have to train women to remove the fear that we have in Uganda right now. The fear of what will happen to you if you get out on the streets and what the police will do to you, it's, uh, you know, it stops women from, from getting out. You, you really have to, uh, you have to pray hard. <laughs> That's why in Uganda, we pray a lot. <laughs> in Liberia, they prayed a lot. <laughs> you see, you have to pray for the courage, but we also have to train women in a nonviolent means of, uh, of interaction, of engagement, and we are doing that training. You have to, you have to train women to, to, to deal with fear and to, to have the courage to move, to move ahead even when things are tight because those before us who opened the door to where we are now were women of courage. And we have to be women of courage to open the door for you for the young woman who just spoke about what she wants to do. We have to do it. And then after we've done it, you will come and you will find new circumstances because that's the way patriarchy is. It recreates itself. You will find new circumstances and you will have to, you will have to deal with that. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> So we appreciate and are humbled by your participation in the Global Engagement Speaker Series. I also want to thank you for the many class visits and meetings that you are participating this week on campus. As a reminder, the Graduate School will, will be hosting an informal conversation and lunch tomorrow from noon until 1 p.m. at Chittenden Hall. Interested graduate students are encouraged to join in that session as well. International Studies and Programs, University Outreach and Engagement, and the Graduate School would like to thank the following units that have co-sponsored Thelma Aware's visit to Michigan State University. The Alliance for African Partnership, the Department of Community Sustainability, James Madison College, the Center for Gender and Global Context, University and Outreach and Engagement's Arts and Cultural Initiatives, the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities, the Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship Program, the Center for Advanced Study of International Development, and the National Collaborative for the Study of University Engagement. On February 15th, the MSU Global Engagement Speaker Series will welcome George Openjuro, who happens to be a personal friend of mine and a colleague of uh, Dr. Aworis. Uh, he's Professor of Education and First Deputy Vice Chancellor of Gulu University in Uganda. For further information about speakers and to view video recordings of their talks, please visit the series website at gess.msu.edu. Now please, us, please join us across the hallway for a reception of light refreshments, and Thelma, have a very pleasant day interacting with our colleagues here at Michigan, Michigan State University. So right across the hall. Thank you. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Thank you.